our mind is important. Our thoughts are important. They are not something to be ignored. They carry weight and they affect our lives. Amen. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Our foundational verse for our study last week was found in Romans 8, verse 6. It says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So we began to talk about the two types of mindsets. There is a carnal mindset and there is a spiritual mindset. A carnal mindset is a mindset that is focused on self. It is a mindset that is prone to sin and looks to satisfy the desires of the flesh. And a spiritual mindset is a mindset that is focused on God. It is a mindset that is trusting God's action in them. A carnal thought by nature is a negative thought. It focuses on circumstances or symptoms or desires and it thinks according to the standards of the world around them. And in contrast, a spiritual thought experiences the same circumstances, the same symptoms, the same desires, but it experiences them from the standpoint of a learned understanding of one's victorious position in God. So we can clearly see the difference here. And we go back to that verse in Romans. It says that if I have a carnal mindset, it will produce death. And if I have a spiritual mindset, it produces life and peace. And I think we can all agree that that is exactly what we want. Amen? Life and peace. We went on to talk about Romans 12. Romans 12 verse 2, it says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. And we began to study that out a little bit. And that word renewing is to revive or to refresh or to bring back to an original condition. An original condition. So we understand that we must be spiritually minded. And to get there, it says that we cannot be conformed to the ways of the world. But instead, we must begin to transform our life by the renewing of our mind. In the Amplified Bible, it says we must get progressively better or progressively more mature spiritually. So we see that the key to this transformation begins in our thinking. And today I'm going to walk you through exactly how you renew your mind. If you brought your Bibles, would you open those with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to begin reading in verse 3. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. The Amplified Bible says, we do not war using the weapons of men. Verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The Amplified Bible says they are not physical. They are not weapons of flesh and blood. But are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5, it says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we begin to see a description here of a battle. We begin to see a talk. Paul is talking about a, a war that is taking place and he's talking about our mind. He's talking about the thoughts that we think. And I want to kind of walk you through these verses a little more in detail. In verse 3, he tells us that we are not engaged in a physical fight. For we walk in the flesh, but we do not war according to the flesh. He says we are engaged in a spiritual fight. 
And it is a war that we cannot win with our flesh. We read on in verse 4 and we're reminded that we have weapons in this war. Now, they're not physical weapons. They're not natural weapons. We don't fight this battle the way that we fight here on earth. Instead, they are spiritual weapons and they come from the spirit of God. And I love the way the second part of that verse reads in the Amplified. It says, in the King James, it says, but the, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. In the Amplified, it says, our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. So we begin to get a mental picture here. We're in a war. It's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. We have weapons. They're not physical or natural weapons. They're spiritual weapons, and we're coming up against an enemy. And it's a stronghold, or it's a fortress. It's something big. And that word stronghold, what it actually means is that it is an imagination or an argument or a thought. So we're fighting a battle, and our enemy is a thought. It is a thought that has become a stronghold. By definition, a stronghold is something that is contrary to or against the word of God. So a stronghold is a thought that is not from God. It is a thought that disagrees with the word of God. Strongholds are thoughts that we think, and that verse goes on to tell us they need to be taken captive and they need to be brought into obedience to Christ. Strongholds by nature are negative thoughts. And the way they begin is it's a negative thought that pops into our mind, and it'll keep reappearing. And if it grabs your attention, then it begins to take root. And it begins to grow. It begins to become elevated. And once that thought takes root, then it becomes your go-to response. It becomes like second nature for you. You just perceive things from that perspective. A stronghold will cause you to do things that you never thought that you would do. We see here that a stronghold doesn't appear instantly. It develops over time, which if I think about that, then I can reason that I have an opportunity or a moment where I can intervene and stop that negative thought or that carnal thought from developing into a stronghold. What Paul is trying to tell us here is that we must deal with the strongholds. We must recognize them and deal with them if we want to renew our mind. And we need to renew our mind because it tells us in Romans that our life will be transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind. So I would just submit to you today that to renew your mind, first of all, you must actually know what you're thinking. You must be paying attention to your thoughts. And then you must address them accordingly. If you've still got your Bibles open in verse 5, I kind of want to break that verse down for you. It says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So when you get out a Bible dictionary and you begin to break this down and you read the commentary and the meaning, if you're taking notes, this is what it means. When it says casting down arguments, it actually means casting down thoughts. And every high thing that exalts itself, it is referring to a stronghold and it describes it as something like a town that is piled up on a stack of rocks. So we begin to get a mental picture here 
There's a level playing field. There's lots of thoughts coming in and out. And then there is a thought that begins to elevate itself. And eventually it's sitting up high on a stack of rocks. It is an exalted thought. It is something that has popped up and it, you have begun to focus on it. Where it says against the knowledge of God, what that actually means is that the thoughts of men resist the knowledge of God as the stronghold of rebels resist the armies of the rightful king. So again, we have a thought that has popped up and it's sitting on top of a pile of rocks and that thought resists the knowledge of God. It stands opposite to the knowledge of God. And Paul begins to paint a picture here using military terminology. He says it's like a rebel army that is resisting the rightful king. It goes on to say that we are to bring every thought into captivity. And what that is actually saying, Paul is telling us that we must expose our thoughts to the divine light. Expose our thoughts to the divine light so that our thoughts can clearly see and know who the able and willing Savior is. The commentary goes on to say that what Paul means is that this figure is taken from military conquests. It's the idea that all the strongholds would be demolished and that when this was done, like throwing down the walls of a demolished city, all the plans and purposes of the soul, the reason, the imagination, and all the power of the mind would be subdued or led into triumph by the gospel like the inhabitants of a captured city. So I'm walking you through this so you can begin to get a mental picture. Paul says, hey, listen, you're at war. You are engaged in a war whether you like it or not. And that war is taking place in your mind. Now, this is not a physical war. This is a spiritual war. And you've got to have a spiritual weapon to engage in this war. And the enemy is an elevated negative thought. It's a thought that has risen up. It has built a pile of rocks and now it sits on top of that pile of rocks and it is the enemy. And that enemy sees the king, the right king coming and it is resisting it. And in order to bring that enemy down, you've got to expose it to the power of the word of God. You've got to bring the mind and you've got to subdue it. You've got to lead it into the gospel and when you do that, you will have captured the enemy and the rocks will begin to crumble. So we can, by nature reading this, understand that if we're going into war, we've got to have a plan. We don't send our military to battle with guns and no plan. We've got to have a plan. And when we go to war, then we understand we can't be passive. War is an aggressive thing. It requires for us to fight. And that goes back to that verse in Romans that says, do not be conformed. Do not be conformed. When, you, when I was teaching that last week, I taught you that you must recognize the ways of the world and then you must choose to not give in to them because the world system is aggressive. It's after you. So do not be conformed, but be transformed by engaging in this battle in your mind and fighting it with your spiritual weapon and then winning. If you're taking notes, I'm going to walk you through kind of a clear process that the scripture outlines for us. Number one, we learn that there is an enemy. There is an enemy and he attacks us in our mind through our thoughts. 
Now we all think millions of thoughts, some of them good, some of them bad, some of them we ignore, some of them we choose to focus on. It's almost as if sometimes we purchase the thought or we buy into it and we take ownership of it. Number two, when we choose to buy into one of those negative thoughts, a stronghold begins to develop. Now, it will happen over time, but that stronghold becomes an exalted thought and it sits up high. It grabs our attention above all of the other thoughts that we are thinking. And so we begin to focus on it. Number three. Based on what I read in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, it tells me that I must take those thoughts captive. So it clearly tells me that it is my job to address the elevated thought. You see, most Christians believe that when they become a Christian that God just takes care of everything. That you can pray and ask him and he just deals with it. And there are moments where he deals with it, but I would submit to you today that you can pray and pray and pray, and not a whole lot is going to happen until you take responsibility for your mind and you do what this verse tells you, which is to take your thought captive. You know, in Genesis 1, it describes our creation. When God created us, he said, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. You see, God gave you dominion and authority. When you become a child of God, you gain access to his power because he lives inside of you, but he is waiting for you to exercise that power, to exercise your dominion and authority. He's waiting for you to take your thought captive. Number four, it says that we must bring our thoughts into captivity and then we must force them into the obedience of Christ. This process happens when we replace the negative thoughts that we think, when we replace the elevated thought with what the word says. You see, you're going to have to force your negative thoughts to submit to the word of God. So we're starting to recognize a few things here. We have to know what we think. We have to manage our thoughts. We have to force our thoughts to focus on God, to focus on his ways, to focus on his kind of thoughts, to focus on his word. We have to then literally exchange our thoughts or replace them with what the word says. You know, on Friday, my little four-year-old daughter woke up, and she said, Mommy, is today my day off? I said, yeah, actually it is. And don't ask me why, but out of her mouth said, you know, Mommy, since it's my day off, I really think that you should take me to that mall, you know, the one that has Build-A-Bear? And after, you know, 12 plus days of being at church nonstop, I thought, she probably deserves a trip to build a bear. So off we went to the mall. And I stopped by a makeup counter. And ladies, I know you'll sympathize with me. I cannot, for the life of me, understand why they don't put good lighting at the makeup counters. So I tried a whole bunch of lipsticks and I decided on one which I was totally convinced was the perfect shade of like a peachy pink or corally pink. And when I got home that night and I got it out, it was the really ugly version of a neon orange. But you see, I'm the kind of shopper 
that never buys something I can't return. I don't like to try stuff on at the stores. I like to take it home. And when it doesn't work out for me, when the lipstick didn't work out yesterday on my way here, I stopped by the mall again and I exchanged it for the perfect shade. Why am I telling you this? Because this is exactly what Paul is describing. You see, he says, look, you've got a thought in your mind, an elevated thought. And the good news is, is that there's a return policy. But first of all, you've got to look at the thought and you've got to say, you know what, that's the wrong color for me. And then you've got to take that thought and you've got to go back and you've got to exchange it for something. And the way you do that is that you go to the word. And you find out what the word says and then you exchange it. What are you talking about, Shannon? Well, let me help clear this up for you. So maybe one day you're sitting there and a thought pops into your mind, you know, I'm a little bit concerned about my future. My boss doesn't seem to be in the same place with me right now, and I'm not too sure how I'm going to pay for my kids' college, and I'm a little bit concerned about my health, and I'm just feeling uncertain about my future. And that thought may pass through your mind one time, and you may barely notice it. But then it may come back again, and then you may go home, and you may tell your spouse, you know what, I'm starting to really worry. How are we going to pay for my kids' college, and how, what's going to happen if something goes wrong at my job? And before you know it, this thought has begun to become elevated. There is a stack of rocks, and you're thinking over and over about your future. And then you're full of worry and full of anxiety and you've been talking about this concern about your future. And what Paul is telling us to do, he says, look, you need to go to the word. And in the word, you need to find the verses that say, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. With long life, I will surely satisfy you, and I will show you my salvation. Maybe one day you wake up, and you've got a headache, and you think to yourself, you know, I guess I slept wrong, but then that headache lingers. And the next day, you're feeling kind of miserable because that headache is still there. And you tell somebody about that headache. And that person says, well, have you called the doctor? And you think to yourself, no, I didn't call the doctor because it was just a headache. And that person begins to tell you, well, you know, I knew somebody who had a headache and they ended up having a stroke. And before you know it, you can't think about anything but the headache. And pretty soon you are consumed with thoughts about what this headache could be. And the devil has shifted your focus over to the symptom. He shifted your focus over to the circumstance and you have an elevated thought. You have a stronghold which is causing you to believe that you might be really sick. It might not just be a headache. And then you tell somebody about it and you begin to give life to that stronghold. You speak about the stronghold. And before you know it, you are consumed and convinced. And what Paul is saying is that you've got to deal with those thoughts. You've got to go home to the word and you've got to open them up and you've got to find the verses that say, Jesus bore my sicknesses. He carried my diseases and by his stripes I am healed. It's just a headache. So Paul begins to walk us through this exchange process. You see, we bought into the thought, but we have a return policy. We can exchange it, and the way we exchange it is we exchange it for what the Word says. 
And then we take it a step further. Because you see, Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. If you hear what I say today, and it's only one thing you take home, let it be this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You will have what you say. What does that mean? That means that when that elevated thought, when that carnal thought, when that negative thought begins to come up in my mind, I better not give life to the negative thought. I certainly should not speak the negative thought. I must take responsibility. I must exercise my dominion and authority. I must go to the word and I must find out what the word says and I must make this exchange and then out of my mouth, I must speak the word of God. Why? Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. So if I think a thought, that's not the problem. The problem becomes when I buy into the thought and then I speak the negative thought out of my mind. You see, you have the power to control your thinking if you will just recognize the negative thought and speak the opposite out of your mouth. Speak the opposite. Don't give life to the carnal thoughts. Give life to the promises of God. Amen? If you've got your Bibles today, would you open them up with me to Matthew 4? Matthew 4, we're going to begin reading in verse 1. And I love this passage because it literally illustrates this process to us. It says, then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards, he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones become bread. But then he answered and said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So Jesus is in the desert and the devil plants a thought in his mind. He speaks into Jesus' mind and he says, if you are the son of God, then command these stones to be bread. We understand that Jesus has been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He's probably feeling a little worn out. He's probably a little hungry and a little thirsty. You see, the devil will always play on your weaknesses. He will always go to the place that you are kind of struggling. Because then he thinks if I can just give her a little tap, she'll go over the edge. So the devil comes to Jesus and he plants this thought, but Jesus quickly recognizes, hey, wait a second, that's not a thought from my heavenly father. And he responds out of his mouth with the word. He says, it is written. We read on. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and he set him on the pinnacle of the temple and he said to him, if you are the son of God, then throw yourself down for it is written. He shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus responds, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So again, the devil plants another thought in Jesus' mind. And he immediately recognizes that that thought is not from God. And so he exchanges it by verbalizing out of his mouth the word of God. It is written. We read on again. The devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only 
you shall serve. And I love this because the third time Jesus rises up and he rebukes the devil even stronger. And again, he exchanges the evil thought by verbalizing the word. These passages mean so much to me. Because it shows me the very thing that Paul is describing. It also shows me the nature of the devil. You see, in Genesis, it calls the devil the most cunning serpent. It says that the serpent is the most conniving and cunning creature that God ever created. So you see, the devil is manipulative. He's not going to plant a thought in your head, hey, if you will think this thought and you'll take ownership of it, then your life is going to go to hell. That would be too obvious. He likes to wrap it up in some twisted language. He likes to make it look more attractive than it actually is. But you see, Jesus quickly recognizes that. And then he speaks to the devil. And the other thing I love in this story is that we see Jesus rebuke the devil more than once. You see, a lot of times we come to church and we hear things like this and we rebuke the devil and then the thought comes back and we just give in. But Jesus is showing us here. That just because he rebuked the devil, the devil came back and tried again. So he rebukes the devil again and then the devil comes back again and then Jesus rises up more forcefully and he says, away with you, Satan. It is written. I would submit to you today that to tear down the strongholds in your mind, you're going to have to deal with them. More than one time. You're going to have to begin to speak the word over and over. And for some of you, it may take a hundred times. For some of you, it may take a thousand times. For some of you, it may take one time. But whatever it is, you've got to recognize it and speak the word. And each time that you speak the word, the devil will begin to back up. And the rocks will begin to crumble. And as you say, it is written, it is written, it is written written it is written it is written it is written satan away with you it is written you see this is a process and a funny thing happens because when you deal with one stronghold the devil will come back and he'll try to create a new one he'll try to get you in another area But the magic is there in the word. You see, there is a process. If you will just begin to give life to the promises of God, you will begin to tear down the negative thoughts. And we understand that we must do that to transform our life because our transformation comes through the renewing of our mind. Amen. So Jesus himself walks us through this process. As I was studying this passage out this week, I looked it up. And when Jesus says it is written, what that actually is, is it's an appeal to the indisputable authority of the word. You see, in that moment, Jesus makes the word the ruler of his conduct, The ruler of his conduct, you see, Jesus says, hey, my thoughts don't rule me. My circumstances don't rule me. My hunger and thirst don't rule me. My feelings don't rule me. The word of God is the ruler of my conduct. You see, in life, when the enemy attacks you, you have a choice to make. You can either give in to the circumstances, give in to the symptoms. You can take ownership 
grip of the headache or out of your mouth, you can say, it is written, Satan. 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 The headache does not rule me. The word of God rules me. My circumstances don't rule me. The word of God rules me. My empty bank account doesn't rule me. The word of God rules me because my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Amen. You see, this is important because as a man thinks, so is he. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. What you think and what you speak are tied together. Now, you see, it's easy to believe this when things are going well. It's a lot harder when you come up to the mountain. It's a lot harder when the circumstances are not going your way. There's this verse in Mark eleven twenty three. 23. You've probably heard us quote it up here. We've probably cheered you into praising God using this verse. It says, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. You see, a lot of people read those verses and they rebuke the mountain and then nothing happens. And they ask themselves, what's wrong with me? Why isn't this working for me? And then they go back to the verse and they see where it says, and does not doubt in my heart. Well, let's be real today. It's almost impossible not to doubt when the circumstances are present. It's almost impossible not to doubt when there's literally no money in the bank. That word doubt there actually means to be divided in one's mind. That's exactly what happens to us. We come up to the mountain and we want to believe that God will meet our need, but we see the empty bank account and we want to believe that God supplies, but we see the empty bank account and so we're divided. And that is where you discover in today's lesson the key to speaking without doubt you see, that doubt is just a divided mind. And Paul has shown us that I can get rid of the division in my mind if I will just speak the word. You see, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word. That actually means that faith comes by hearing and hearing the spoken word of God. So the more I speak the word, the more I speak speak the word. It is a spiritual law. My faith is forced to respond to the spiritual law. So even when I don't feel it, even when I don't believe it, even when it doesn't seem possible, when my mind is going back and forth, if I will just speak the spoken word of God, my faith is forced to respond. And the more I speak it, the more I speak it to the mountain, the more I declare it is written, the more I will believe that it is written and the mountain will surely be cast into the sea. Amen. Did you learn some things today?